This is Echo Zoe Radio, episode 175 for November 2022, with Jane Clatt on the English Reformation under James I. Welcome to Echo Zoe Radio, the podcast outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries, where you'll hear about important topics affecting the church today. Our primary goal is to explore a variety of issues while remaining faithful to God and His Word. Stay with us for the next hour as your host, Andy Olson, shares his conversation with this month's guest. Here's your host, Andy Olson. I'm Andy Olson. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. This is episode 175 for November 2022. Jean Clyatt returns for a third installment of English Reformation history. Jean was first on with me in August of last year, where he talked about the early days of the English Reformation under Henry VIII and Bishop Thomas Cranmer. In the May episode this year, Jean returned to talk about England under Queen Elizabeth I. Both of these episodes were pretty interesting, so if you didn't hear them, now would be a great time to pause and go back and listen to them. You can find the first one at echozoe.com slash 160 and the second at echozoe.com slash 169. For this episode, we recap a little bit of the previous two and get into King James VI of Scotland, who became King James I of England. Gene shares a little bit about how James became king, and then he gets into the gunpowder plot, which happened on November 5th, 1605, and was the inspiration behind this being the November episode. This episode should be on Rumble, so if you wish to watch uh, the video, it's there, as well as up at Echozoi, the Echozoi Locals page, echozoi.locals.com in both audio and video formats. If you're seeing it on YouTube, come on over and subscribe to Echozoi on Rumble too. Uh, video will continue to go up on R- YouTube, but I'm putting more emphasis on Rumble and Locals in an effort to stay ahead of Big Tap censorship. Also, in regards to social media, you can find Echozoi on Twitter, Truth, uh, Gab, Parler, Getter, and Telegram. You can find an up-to-date list of all these websites at echozoe.com slash linktree. And at the time of this recording, Elon Musk has been owner of Twitter for only a few days, but I'm hopeful that the future looks a little better for Twitter, and I look forward to getting back to being a little bit more engaged there again. But at a minimum, I'll be posting uh, podcast alerts on all the other sites as well. Finally, I want to every, remind everyone about the Christian podcast community. Echozoi Radio is only one of many excellent, biblically faithful podcasts that you can find at the Christian podcast community. There are a lot of them. In fact, our guest this month, Gene Clyatt, is one of them. Gene does a daily show called Squirrel Chatter, in which he reads from the Book of Common Prayer, reads various scriptures, and then talks about a general topic of the day. You can find the entire list at christianpodcastcommunity.org. And then while you're there, you can subscribe to the shows that you want to hear indirect, individually and directly, or you can subscribe to the community feed and get all of the shows in one big, huge feed. Show notes for this episode are available at echozoe.com slash 175, and that's where you'll find an outline of the discussion, uh, additional resources, uh, related episodes. You'll find those previous two that I mentioned that we've done on English Reformation history with Gene Clyatt will be down in the uh, related episodes section towards the bottom of the page. With that, here's my discussion with Gene. Gene, I just got done listening to our episode, I want to say May episode, from Queen Elizabeth I. Right, last spring. Last spring, yep. I'm not a big... uh, fast you know a lot of people like to listen to podcasts at two two x or one and a half x i can't do that either i I don't do that either i I can do it with myself with as i like when i'm doing show notes a lot of times we're doing video now so i have a little different workflow when i do video when i do audio only i do the editing and i do the show notes at the same time when i do video i do video concentrate on the video i export the audio from the video and then I go back and listen at 1.7 or 2x to do the show notes. 
But uh, normally, no. I'm not Andrew Rappaport. I can't listen to everything. Yeah. At double speed. But He uh, says he does it, but I don't know if I believe him. Well, he listens to so much, I don't know if there's any other way. Yeah. I think he does it in his sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would probably make sense, too. So last time we talked, we went through the life of Queen Elizabeth I. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth, and we're, we're focusing and, mainly, trying to focus on the effect on English Protestantism. Mm-hmm. And, and Queen Elizabeth II was still with us at the time. At the time, yeah. We've had quite the change with, uh, now we have King Charles III. Charles III, yeah. And, so. uh, Charles I and Charles II were both in the 17th century, and neither one of them were uh, exactly good kings. So hopefully, well, that's what I've heard is that he's he picked an odd royal name because yeah. uh, it hasn't been a good legacy thus far. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Uh, they've had bad luck with kings named Charles, but maybe third time's the charm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I had a great deal of respect for Elizabeth II, and um, thought she was a really good queen. Um. Not quite sure how Charles will do. We'll give him a chance. Yeah. Um, given, his, not, given some of his predilections, I don't have high hopes for him. Yeah. I'm hoping, and, and rumor has it, that he is going to back off on a lot of his um, more... Progressive? Odd, yeah, progressive ideas. Well, the thing is that as crown prince, he could be an advocate. Mm -hmm. for certain things as the crown the way things stand the crown is not supposed to advocate publicly for a political position now saying that the crown meets with the prime minister once a week and we have a new prime minister this week too yeah, yeah um, i don't yeah, have high hopes English for him politics either this last week uh yeah, I, his predilections seem to be very similar to the king. He seems to be king. very much a a World Economic Forum. Yeah, but so is Charles. Yeah, which it may not be a bad thing. They may work well together, which is frightening. Well, yeah, yeah. Do we um, want them to work to well together? Yeah, I, I. They might be an open I revolt really liked, pretty soon. It sounds like he might soften Brexit. He might, uh, yeah, he was, or, he or was even a maybe reverse some of that. So they might have an open revolt, uh, yeah, before too long. It's, it, it, uh, he was a remainer, he was not in favor of Brexit. Um, although he says he will support it because it was the will of the English people, but he was not the, the guy. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, you know, Boris Johnson was very much in favor of Brexit, but they forced him out. Mm -hmm. And then they got uh, Liz Truss, who lasted 45 days. And I liked her. Her, pro, her policies that she proposed were very akin to Margaret Thatcher's. Okay. And so she was, she was proposing, you know, and, Margaret Thatcher, you know, was prime minister through most of the 80s and early 90s. And she led Britain to a period of relative prosperity, some of their most prosperous times since the end of the empire. Mm -hmm. And but then, you know, um, Liz Truss was coming in with very, very similar programs, but she didn't have the backbone of Margaret Thatcher right? because when she got pushback, she caved. And as soon as she caved, it was pretty much all over for her. And I don't follow and, as closely as you do, but some of the sources I follow suggest that maybe that was kind of anticipated by the people who pushed Boris out and that they yeah. really wanted, what's his name? Like Rishi Sunak or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but guy. he was he was he was overwhelmingly defeated in the leadership battle by Liz Truss. But I mean, this was the, but yeah, the parliament. I think Parliament 
the parliamentarians in the conservative party wanted soon the the new guy yeah but liz truss was popular with the party at large mm-hmm. because the leadership battle went to a general vote of conservative party members not just members of parliament but the the rank and file oh. and they overwhelmingly chose liz truss but yeah i think you're right i think the the uh, can we call it the establishment Tories? Mm-hmm. They're they're similar to the establishment Republicans. Yeah, that they're the leaders of the conservative party. They're the conservative party members of Parliament, but they're not conservatives. Right, and I think they were the ones that kind of knew that they could for, they could yeah. handle Liz Truss and, and as they soon could as, get what they as wanted. As soon as out of she her. showed any sign of weakness, they. They were after her, but they seemed to know that that's the direction it was going to go. And yeah, I think that was their that plan. That was part all of along. the plot all along. Yeah, but I uh, think that was the plan all along. But sure. sad. Yeah, I, I I wonder how things are going to go. But that's twenty first yeah, we'll century see. England. That's twenty first century. We're talking yeah. about seventeenth century. We're talking about seventeenth century. century England. Mm-hmm. So we ended up with uh, with the death of Queen Elizabeth in sixteen o three. And when she passed away, her closest relative, and therefore her heir, was King James VI of Scotland. And so King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. And this was because James VI of Scotland was the son of Mary... He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. And so he was born back in 1566. So we're going to back up about 25 years. Now, we should back up a little bit. I should mention before we get too too far into this, we're picking up on uh, episode uh, 169, I believe. I was listening to it on the, a couple hours ago. Yeah, we, we started about, last year. We started last year with Henry VIII. <laughs> we started off with with yeah. Reformation history and English Reformation history, Henry VIII. And, and I, Henry VIII was was followed on the throne by his son Edward the Sixth. Mm-hmm. And Edward the Sixth was another child king, and he died when he was fifteen. And when he died, you know, Elizabeth had broken with or not Elizabeth, um, Henry had broken with Roman Catholicism, with, broken with the Pope, and started the Church of England. Edward VI was actually very strongly Protestant. And so during his short reign, um, the Protestant leaders of the Church of England really moved to make the Church of England a Protestant church. But he died very young. And that led to the ascension of Mary Tudor, who was Edward the first or Edward the <laughs> Henry the Eighth's eldest daughter, um, and he she was the Roman Catholic daughter of Catherine, who was his first queen, and so she became queen, and she tried very very hard to move England back into the Catholic camp. She probably would have had pretty good success, except for the fact that, A, she was very, very militant in her Catholicism in that she started having Protestants put to death, burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. Um, Some 300 people were burned at the stake publicly for the crime of being Protestant. And so she was not, she had no reconciliation (laughs) in her, her plan at all. The other thing was she was already in her forties. She was unable to have any children. Then she married a prince of Spain. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, you know, a, a doubly Catholic monarchy. And that was not a popular move because the English didn't like the Spanish. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, led to quite a bit of war between England and Spain under Mary's sister Elizabeth. Um, because Mary died um, very soon. She only reigned for about five, six years when she died um, and left the kingdom to her half-sister, 
Henry VIII's daughter by his second queen, Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth becomes Queen of England, and she reigns for quite a long time. And her brand of Protestantism was not as strictly Protestant as Edward VI. Um, all the leaders of the English Reformation had been killed under Mary. So she didn't have this established clergy. Now, many Protestants returned from the continent where they had fled during Mary's short reign, but they were not the leaders of the Church of England. And so her Church of England was more of a compromised church. She started out not wanting problems with the Catholics. She kind of relaxed, you know, she wasn't, she didn't come in as a, a rabid anti-Catholic. Right. But trying the to Catholics kill her. <laughs> kept trying to kill her. They kept trying to kill her. They kept trying to kill her. And we, yeah. and we, last time we looked at all the different plots against her. Yeah, I just that's what I was just trying to mention was, and you were as you were talking, I was I, I wanted to get my numbers right, but it'll be in the show notes, echozoe dot com slash one seventy five for this episode. Down at the bottom, um, uh, related episodes. One sixty was our first one, where we talked about the original background, Henry the Eighth and whatnot, and then one sixty nine was the, the Elizabeth the first episode, and we got into all that, lots of plots. Four different plots? Yeah, try four, to kill four major plots. <laughs> major plots. Major plots. Nice caveat there. And yeah. then, uh, so 160, 169, and then this episode is 175. All right. Um, so a lot I'm of backstory. Very interesting. <laughs> That's why you're back is because they're so interesting. <laughs> well, it is interesting um, because it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's yeah. it's you know it's it's you know it's the game of thrones so everybody keeping their clothes on i guess um you know so because the the back and forths the the plots the everything that's going on it it, it it doesn't stop with elizabeth now backing up we talked about this last time because we talked about mary queen of scots but i kind of want to go over it again okay mary queen of scots she had been queen of France. She was queen of Scotland and queen of France at the same time. She was the queen of Scotland, and then she had married the king of France. Okay. But the king of France died, and so she moved back to Scotland. And so she was in direct rule of Scotland. She was not popular. Scotland was, by this time pretty much Presbyterian. John Knox is there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and Mary does not get along well with John Knox because Mary was a Roman Catholic. Well, Mary, she, she gets back into Scotland and she marries Lord Darnley, Henry Stewart. And their marriage was not popular. He wasn't really popular. She wasn't really popular. Um, this was, you know, not a comfortable situation all around. Well, when she was six months pregnant, her husband, Lord Darnley, kills her private secretary, David Rizzio, because he thinks they're having an affair. They probably weren't. She was having an affair, people believe, but it wasn't with him. Okay. <laughs> but she, he kills her private secretary, stabs him to death right in front of her while she's six months pregnant with James. Mm -hmm. Well, the next year, that's in 1566. That's the year James is born. He's born in June and he's the only child of, of Mary and Lord Darnley. And both Mary and her husband, Henry, Lord Darnley, were great-grandchildren of Henry VIII, or Henry VII, Henry VIII's dad. 
by Henry VIII's older sister, Margaret. So they had, the those lines had descended from Margaret, and then they had joined back together. So they were cousins when they got married. And so this is James's parents. Now, like I said, he had killed her private secretary right in front of her. Well, the next year, Mary has him murdered in February. So, you know, in, in March, he kills her private secretary. The following February, she has him killed. And then she marries the Earl of Bothwell, who was the prime suspect in Darnley's murder. Okay. Earl of Bothwell is also who she was probably having an affair with. And when you think about all of that, you know, James's parentage is kind of suspect. Mm -hmm. Because if Mary was having an affair, who's to say Lord Darnley is actually his father? So, you know, we don't have genetic testing. We can't go back yep. and look, you know. Um, the birth certificate says Darnley's his dad, so Darnley's his dad. Uh, laughing about a birth certificate. Well, you know, I, I was just thinking about it. Like, given that uh, interview I did with Nathaniel Jeanson at uh, Answers in Genesis, you could probably could look up through the descendants, at least look at the Y chromosome, and does it does it match up to... You might be able to, yeah. One or the other. I, I wouldn't know. know. That's genetics is far outside my purview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wouldn't uh, be surprised if you. If I wouldn't they be surprised could, either. Could figure right. it out through the Y chromosome. And and then again, this goes back to you know, the Game of Thrones. We got mm -hmm. you know cheating cheating spouses and murders and all of that. And this is while this is starting before James is born, and this is the Scotland he grows up in. Yeah. Um, so after Mary has Darnley killed and then marries his most likely murderer. Now, Darnley's killed in February of 1567. In May of 1567, Mary marries Bothell. <laughs> so, I mean, just a few months later, mm -hmm. she's marrying the guy that everybody thinks killed her husband. That, you know, like I said, who was she having an affair with? I think we can figure that out. Yeah. So that's in May. In July, the, this this causes a revolt. And, and she's actually captured by Scottish earls who revolt against it. And they take her prisoner. They kill Bothwell. And then they exile Mary to England after forcing her to abdicate her throne. Now, actually, I think they intended to keep her sequestered, but she escaped to England, thinking that Elizabeth would help her. But she gets down into England, and Elizabeth shuts her up in a, in a castle somewhere. Mm -hmm. So she's forced to abdicate the throne to her son, James, who is 13 months old. And that's when he becomes king. He of becomes Scotland. King James the Sixth, King of Scotland, at age 13 months. So, of course, regents are going to rule Scotland for the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there's a succession of regencies, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but but there's there's conflict, and each one of them, you know, has his uh cheer squad and his detractors and they're going after trying to to drive him out so it's just a it's a it, it's kind of you know i always picture a couple of terriers fighting over a ball mm -hmm. james the sixth is the ball yeah. because whoever controls james controls scotland and so you have competing groups of scottish nobles fighting over james Meanwhile, James himself is kind of shut up and being, he, he's, he's a student, you know, he's. I, I'm just curious then who would be, who would be the heir if something happened to James? At that point. At yeah. that age. Who's the. It, it, yeah. 
I'm not sure. I have I'd have to look at the Because you almost gotta the expect that there's gonna be plots. Yeah. Now you he know. had uncles, you know, that probably would have seized the throne. Um while he was a kid, it was easier to rule through him. Yeah. You know. He have him as the the titular head while you the regent actually runs the country. Sure. And sometimes it was a regent, sometimes it was a regency council. It depend on how strong the person in charge at that time was. So it went back and forth between, I think there were about three or four major regencies sure. during his minority when he was a, a child. Now, he was a sickly child. He, he was never physically robust. He had to be tied to the saddle to learn to ride the horse. Mm. He loved riding horses because he physically wasn't able to run and jump. But once he learned to ride horses, he loved that because he could get out sure. and he could run and jump on a horse. Yeah. But even then he wasn't all that athletic because, you know, he had to, to be very careful to stay in the saddle. And like I said, as a child, he was tied to the saddle. Um, even as an adult, he usually leaned on a companion while walking. So whenever he was walking around in the, the palace in Scotland or later in his palace in London, he would be leaning on someone. Um, so, but he was, a, he was a student. He was very intelligent, very studious. Um, and I think the fact that he was physically weak lent itself to intellectual pursuits mm -hmm. because he couldn't be a sense. physical. Yeah. Yep. So he was a he was a bookish child, to use that that phrase. Now, he was raised and trained by Scottish Presbyterian tutors, mm -hmm. many of them clergymen. Right. And he was raised to be a staunch Protestant. He wasn't really. Okay. And generally from the, the thing, and I'm, I'm not sure where he got this. It was the common view that was rising among the crowned heads of Europe at the time. But it's this whole idea, and it, it, it goes back, you know, a century or more, but it was, it was gaining in popularity and it was gaining in prominence. And that's this whole idea of the divine right of kings. Yeah, you brought that up a little bit in the last episode. And and James was very much a divine right of kings guy. In fact, he said that that uh, that kings were gods because, like God, they had the power of life and death over their subjects. Mm -hmm. And so, he wasn't really a. Protestant, I don't even think he was really a Christian. Sure. Um, but he was brought up and trained in Protestant theology. But he, he never really glommed onto it. He certainly wasn't a Presbyterian. In fact, he didn't like the Presbyterian church because the Presbyterian church held themselves aloof from the crown of Scotland. When he became king of England, he liked the Anglican church much better because he was head of the Anglican church. Uh. <laughs> and so he could issue decrees to the Anglican church that would be, mm -hmm. be uh, followed. Well, after he became an adult, um, he, he was, regents would rule Scotland in his name until he turned 15 in 1579. But even then... In 1580 or in 1582, there was a revolt and he was captured and held prisoner for two years, almost two years, by the Earl of Angus and the Earl of Gowry. And they had imprisoned him in Rothven Castle. They desired to control Scott, the Scottish government through him. You know, even though now he's not, he's no longer being governed by a regency because he's been declared an adult, but they want to control the government through him, even though that time has passed. 
and there were there were a couple of things. One thing, John James was already a spendthrift monarch. He he very much spent money. And so there was some concern because of his spending habits. There were higher taxes to pay for them, and higher taxes were unpopular. <laughs> oh, I wonder why. I wonder why. So that was part of it. The other thing was that these Scottish earls were strong, staunchly Protestant Presbyterians, and they feared a return of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Catholic rule. James had had contact with France, and remember his mother had been Queen of France, mm -hmm. and so he had uncles by marriage in France, and he was he was uh, shopping for a wife, and he was considering several French princesses among the 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 ladies that he was looking at. Well, the, the Presbyterian no, that probably wasn't Scot too popular. Scots didn't want a Catholic queen. Right. They'd just gotten rid of one, you know. So probably that didn't wasn't want, I mean, even set aside the Catholic, they probably weren't right. too thrilled about a French uh, queen or, either. Yeah, so they they had seized control. And that lasted for about two years. But he, 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 was, he was able to uh, get free of that. But... In that was in 1582, 1583. In 1587, after plot after plot after plot against Elizabeth, Mary, Queen of Scots, is executed. In 1589, two years later, James marries 14, James is now 23. Okay. He marries 14 year old Anne of Denmark. A Danish yeah. princess. Her father is a Protestant. She is believed to be Protestant. She would later formally convert to Roman Catholicism. We don't know really at what point she was enticed into Roman Catholicism. But he marries this Danish princess. And it's important in other aspects of our discussion tonight. So we'll come back to Anne of Denmark. Okay. But he, he marries Anne of Denmark. Then in 1601, it's Elizabeth is old now. She is sickly. It is known that she is going to die. It is known that James is going to be her heir because there, there really isn't anybody else. Mm -hmm. And because she did not marry, she had no children. Um. Yeah, you got into that a bit on the and last so James, episode. James is the guy. Yeah. So Robert Cecil, who is Elizabeth the First Secretary of State, corresponded with James in preparation of Elizabeth's death. So beginning a couple of years before Elizabeth died, Elizabeth's Secretary of State is corresponding with the King of Scotland who will be king of England upon Elizabeth's death. Mm -hmm. So all of this is being set up that when Elizabeth dies, it's going to be James, and that's the way it's going to be. Now, who is Robert Cecil? He's another guy that we'll talk about a little bit more tonight. You remember when we talked about the plots of, against Queen Elizabeth, we talked about her master spy master? Yep. Francis Wal Walsingham. Well, he died in 1590. Robert Cecil is the guy who took his place. Okay. So Robert Cecil so is master. Elizabeth's spy master and secretary of state, and he will become James's spy master. Okay. He will keep that position when James ascends to the throne. And as you see, he's starting in 1601. He's been establishing a relationship with James. Mm -hmm. And indeed, he becomes one of James's staunchest supporters. And uh, we'll see that here in a little bit. So Elizabeth hadn't married. She hadn't had any children. James was her heir. And Cecil is working out what's going to happen. So on March 24th of 1603, Queen Elizabeth dies. Okay. 
messages are sent north to Edinburgh, to James in Scotland. And on April 5th, James departs from Edinburgh for London. He makes a slow journey south. He is stopping along the way at every Lord's Manor on his way to London. And he's being wined and dined by every local Lord on his way sure. down. He leaves. It, it's April I 5th. I imagine it's probably a little bit yeah. of not just them whining and dining, but him wanting he's, to make sure he's got he's allies. He's a politician. He right. is a politician. He's a very good politician. So he's making his way slowly down south. And as he's moving along, he's, you know, uh, being entertained by these lords along the way as he passes through their lands. And he is amazed by England's wealth compared to Scotland. This is, these guys live in a way that Scottish lords don't live. And he makes a comment that in becoming king of England, he was exchanging a stony couch for a feather bed. Okay. He's liking this. England looks rich compared to Scotland. And, and things are much different than what he's used to in Scotland. So he leaves Scotland on April 5th. He arrives in London on May 7th. He's taking his time getting there. Yeah. Now, granted, he's on horseback, but it's not that far. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, you know, Elizabeth dies in March, March 24th. And by April 5th, word has gotten to James and he's packed up and heading south. Mm -hmm. So it didn't take long for the message to get north. Right. He's taking much slower going south. And you're right. It's politicking. He's mm -hmm. politicking his way down. Well, he arrives in May 7th. And then on July 25th, he's coronated at Westminster Abbey. Now, because of plague, there weren't a great deal of festivities. Um, it's, it was a you know closed church with just a small group of people. He's coronated. It wasn't until the following March, 1604, a year after Queen Elizabeth has died, that the official royal entry into the city would take place, all the pageantry and all of that. But by this time, he's been king for nine months. Mm -hmm. So I'm just doing the math, too. He would have been uh, about 37, roughly, as he, roughly. As he be becomes That's king. He was born in 66. 15, so he would 66 have been 20, to 1603. 27, 28. 37. From 66? Yep. Yeah, you're right. You're right. 30 years. 37, yep. roughly. Plus I'm a historian, minus. not a mathematician. <laughs> All right. Well, very early in his reign, we have what we know as the gunpowder plot. Yeah, this which is, brings us to why we're doing this as the November yeah. episode. Yeah, because everybody <laughs> remembers your birthday. Oh, you remember, huh? Remember, remember the 5th of November, well, gunpowder, right. treason, and plot. I yeah. know of no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Yeah. The gunpowder plot. Well, I'm, rem I'm impressed that you remembered that that's how I remember November 5th. <laughs> well, I remembered it because we talked about it last time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened was that there was a plot to kill the king and parliament and establish a Catholic monarchy. This sounds very, very similar to the yep. plots against Elizabeth. Now, what had happened was um, there was a, a man named Thomas Percy who was a minor noble, nephew of, of a lord. And he was an intermediary between English Roman Catholics and King James VI of Scotland. In the late 1590s, early 1600s, not only had Robert Cecil realized James is going to be the new king soon, so had the English Roman Catholics. 
And so they had sent to James emissaries, among them Thomas Percy. And Thomas Percy went up there and and met with James. And they were hoping that James would ease up on Roman Catholics. Now, remember that Elizabeth had started out fairly easy on Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. But as the plots to kill her numerated, her attitude towards Roman Catholics had become harsher. Understandably. Yeah. Now, she had actually had more Roman Catholics killed than her elder sister had had Protestants killed. Like three times as many. Well, but difference being they were trying to kill her. Exactly. (laughs) They they were, everyone that she killed was actively plotting to overthrow her or Mm -hmm. had actually taken up arms against her. So her Protestantism had nothing to do with it. Well, her Protestantism Mm. had to do with why they were attacking her, but it had nothing to do with why she was having her side. Right. You try to take out the king or the queen, you're... The old phrase is, you better not miss. Right. So what they had looked at, now, when the Pope excommunicated Elizabeth, he actually sent out a papal bull saying, you have no obligation, you you Englishmen who are, you know, now that she's been excommunicated, you have no obligation to obey her. You know, your obligation is to obey the Pope. And so among the... Protestant rulers of England, Roman Catholics by this time are now viewed as foreign agents. They are agents of a foreign power. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're, you know, it's like the 1950s and you're working for the Soviet Union in the United States. The, the, there was a great deal of suspicion, almost a McCarthyite suspicion of Roman Catholics. If you're a Roman Catholic, you have no allegiance to the crown. Your allegiance is to the Pope. And you're probably plotting to overthrow the crown because the Pope wants the crown gone. You know, the mm-hmm. Pope wants, wants to return the monarchy to Roman Catholic rule. So that had developed over time. And Robert Cecil, who is the, the um, final spy master for Elizabeth and becomes uh, James's spy master was indeed, you know, very anti-Catholic. Now, James, probably because of all the plots that he grew up under, all of the... The, um, the regencies? The regencies and, and the, the, the warring factions that had tried to control him. Mm-hmm. He had become very, very good at the political expediency of implying things he didn't actually say. Okay. So when you came to meet with James... But intentional? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very intentional. Okay. He, he, would, he would mislead you into thinking he supported you without ever coming out and saying he supported you. So that you would leave a meeting with him thinking he was on your side. But the fact is, you really didn't know what he thought. Mm -hmm. Well, these Roman Catholics had been coming up to Edinburgh to try to get the measure of this new king and hoping that he would go easy uh, and and relax some of the anti-Roman Catholic laws in England. And while they're doing this, they're coming out of those meetings thinking that James was going to do exactly that. And in fact, when James gets to England, he does relax some of the anti-Catholic laws. But very quickly, two things materialize. One of them was that Catholics paid a penalty for not attending Church of England services. Okay. Of 20 pounds a month. Wow. Which was a lot of money back then. That is a lot of money. That was an awful lot of money back then. And so 
he had relaxed that, but then, remember, he was a spendthrift king. Mm -hmm. He liked to spend money. And very quickly, he realized, hey, that's my money. <laughs> so he put those laws back into effect. There was also the fact that the Protestant rulers around him, the Protestant lords and ladies of England, were not happy when he relaxed these. And there was, so there was some protest. Sure. And by this time, England is pretty much Protestant. When you, when you talk about Roman Catholics, you're talking about probably less than 10% of the population. So the Church of England leaders don't like him relaxing these rules. And so the rules get put back into place. Well, this causes Thomas Percy and the other English Catholics to now view James as a promise breaker. He broke his word to us. Now, he had never given his word to them. Sure. But they thought he had because of the way that he would play off courtiers against each other and make them think he was on their side. He would play both sides against each other. And so that's what he had done with the Catholics. Well, now they think, you know, he didn't keep these promises. Now some hotheads want to get rid of him. And they come up with this plan. There's a guy named Robert Catsby. And he is the he's the ringleader behind all this thing. Okay. Tall, now, good we're still looking. talking about the gunpowder plot. We're talking about right? the gunpowder plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert Catsby is the leader of the gunpowder plot. It's his idea. He comes up with this plan. And it's a convoluted plan. The idea is to blow up the king and parliament, blow up the House of Lords during the opening ceremonies of parliament. When the king is there, all of his ministers are there, both houses of parliament are there, they're all gathered in this great hall, and they're going to blow up the hall and kill all of them. But that's just the beginning. James had a nine-year-old daughter named Elizabeth. Okay. Who was, for want of a better term, off at boarding school. Okay. She was being fostered by a family in the English countryside. Away from the city, they were raising her. She was being educated there. So the plan was to blow up parliament, kill the king, kill the parliament, kill all the ministers, kill all the leaders of the of the Church of England. Okay. Because the Archbishop of Canterbury, everybody's there, right? This is this is like the time when everybody's together in one spot that you this can knock like, all off. This would be almost like dropping a bunker buster on Congress during the State of the Union. Exactly. Exactly. Which actually was the plot of... Uh, um, without honor, if you remember the Tom Clancy novel, okay, it, it involved a war between the United States and Japan. It's a, it's an interesting okay. thing taking place, a modern war against the United States and Japan that ends with the defeat of Japan and the ringleader, because his son, died, not the ringleader, but one of the one of the characters. His son was killed in the fighting with the United States. He's a Japanese airline pilot. He flies his airliner into uh, okay. the Capitol building during a joint thing at Congress. Was this written? This was written pre nine eleven. This is one oh, of those, yeah, pre one of those stories yeah. that people yeah. went back and wondered. Was it inspired by one of these yeah. stories? Yeah, it was written years before. Um, but that was the idea that mm -hmm. it, you know it killed everybody. Except for uh, Jack Ryan, the the main character of all those Clancy novels, and he ends up as president. Okay, that, at the end of that book, and then designated the next novel survivor was Executive or Orders. Is he like de huh? designated survivor? Is that what they call? Yeah, that no, person? he was he was be, he had just been nominated as vice president. Okay, the vice president was forced to resign, but they they always was, have like 
during the State of the Union with everybody right. convening. So there's there. some they always cabinet have member this, who's not there. There's somebody yeah. who's a designated yeah. survivor. So yeah, but Congress Congress had just voted to accept him as uh, vice president because he was he was nominated mm-hmm. by the president, appointed. Which you know presidents do between if a right. vice president leaves office between elections, the president nominates and then Congress has to confirm right. a new vice president. Yep. And so that's what that had just happened, and he was in the tunnel walking from the congressional office building to the Capitol building to make a speech when the, the attack has. happened. Sure. And so he gets hustled out and saved and becomes the president. And then the, the next novel was Executive Orders, which was okay. the Jack Ryan as president. I love Tom Clancy. Those <laughs> were great novels. So, yeah, that was the idea. Blow sure. up Parliament. Blow up the House of Lords during the, the State of the Union. But then kidnap this nine-year-old Princess Elizabeth. Marry her to... A uh, Catholic. Catholic lord, English uh-huh. Catholic lord, and rule England through her, which sounds remarkably like all the plots against Elizabeth. Yeah. Except instead of marrying Mary Queen of Scots off to some English nobleman who would then claim the crown, they were going to marry James the first daughter off to some nobleman and take the the thing. So. This was the idea. This was the plot. It was this convoluted plot. Um, now, Catsby begins to recruit a few friends to his plot, but they need a gunpowder expert. And one of the conspirators that he's already talked to knows an Englishman who has been fighting for on the as a soldier for Spanish Roman Catholic powers in the continent as as a sp- soldier for the Spanish against Protestants okay. on the continent and uh, this is a guy by the name of Guy Fox uh-huh okay so they That's... recruit him he is the explosives expert he's the gunpowder expert he also has the advantage of not being known in London because all of the rest of these guys are known in London. And so they can't be seen openly going into certain places. Sure. But nobody knows who Guy Fox is. So Doesn't he walk in... around with a mask? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no the, the mask is supposed to be a mask of him, not his mask. <laughs> So, Catsby, disillusioned by the first few months and by the fact that that James hasn't relented on the anti-papist policies, hatched this idea to assassinate James, and he starts recruiting people. And on May 20th, they have their first meeting of the conspirators at a famous place called the Duck and Drake Inn. Okay. Sadly, it no Never longer exists. It. Yeah, it no longer exists, but it's, it's well known because of this plot. Mm-hmm. It was the headquarters of the plotters. This is where they had their meetings, and they had several of them. It was also a known Roman Catholic haunt. Okay. Now, because of this, there are several questions. Five conspirators met, were at that first meeting. Now, it would grow to be 13. But it started with these five, and it's Robert Catsby, Thomas Wintour, John Wright, Guy Fox, and Thomas Percy. That's the original group. Now, Thomas Percy is the guy who had been met meeting with the king. Mm-hmm. He's a minor noble. So they get together at the Duck and Drake Inn for their very first meeting, and there they swear an oath of secrecy and, you know, all of this. They're going to kill the king. They're going to kill Parliament. They're going to take over. So also at the Duck and Drake was a Jesuit priest, Father John Gerard, or Gerard, 
I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's G-E-R-A-R-D. I think it's Gerard. Sounds good to me. He's a Jesuit priest. Now, Jesuits, the, the, the whole order of the Jesuits was specifically designed to be anti-Protestant. Mm-hmm. You know, Ignatius Loyola and, and the whole well, order. Of counter, counter-reformation. Counter, right? Counter-reformation stuff, right? right. So th- there were many Jesuit priests in England in hiding on the one hand ministering secretly to the Roman Catholics in England, but also they were agents. Sleeper cells. Yeah. And, and so there's dispute over his involvement. He's believed to be involved by the Protestants. The Catholics deny his involvement. None of the conspirators who lived to be questioned identified him. But that was the, you know, so it, it's speculative whether or not he was involved. I believe he was. Mm-hmm. I believe there were Jesuits behind this just as there had been foreign powers behind all the plots against Elizabeth, I think there were foreign powers behind this plot as well. Um, yeah, all this so, going on, I, I can't help but wonder, because I'm not an English historian, Yeah, when did this finally come to an end? When did they finally stop trying to take out the Protestant kings? And- this pretty much ended it. It, okay, this is and it. Honestly, now, yeah, you have, see, after after this, you really don't have another Roman Catholic plot. Um, now, you end up with a Roman Catholic king. <laughs> okay. But that's, a, that, that's not through plots and machinations. It's just the fact that one of the heirs of the throne ends up converting to Catholicism and marries a Catholic and all of that, but that's sure. later in the 17th century. That's actually after the Civil War. Okay. Um, but so this kind of ends it, because after this you have the um, parla- pu- the, the um, Puritan Parliament against the Crown, and you have the English Civil War, the restoration of the monarchy and all, you know, it's a, it's a very, very busy century. Mm -hmm. I know when we originally talked about this, we were already been talking for an hour. When we originally talked about this, we were going to talk about the entire 17th century. Yeah. We (laughs) haven't even finished the (laughs) gunpowder plot yet. So (laughs) let me, let me see if I can wrap the (laughs) gunpowder plot up. Yeah. I was going to ask, how was this thwarted? Yeah. So, now, because the Duck and Drake was a known Catholic haunt, there is speculation that um, Robert Ro- Cecil may have known say, about Rob, the plot Robert from Suthel the beginning. Is, is he uh, such a spy master yeah. like his predecessor? He had, we know that he had agents in most major Roman Catholic groups in England. He was getting intelligence. He may have been watching the inn. He may have known about the meeting from the beginning. He may have known about it before it happened. We don't know. But what ended up happening is it, it, it grew and grew. They, they kept recruiting people because they needed stuff. You know, we yep. need a place in the Midlands where we can take the princess after we kidnap her. So we'll bring that, you know, bring in a a lord from the Midlands who has a a manor house we can use. So, and we needed, you know, this or that. Well, what they ended up doing, just to to make this a a concise as possible, the sellers of the Palace of Winchester, what's known as the Undercroft, was available for rent. Okay. Okay. As storage units, basically like, you know, House of Lords mini storage. <laughs> okay. And so Lord Percy rents, you know, Thomas Percy rents 
an undercroft that happens to be right under where the throne would be okay. during this joint session of, of Parliament. And they pack, I think it's 36 barrels of gunpowder. Wow. Into this basement room. And the opening day of Parliament was going to be November 5th. And so they were going to blow up Parliament on the opening day. Hmm. On November 3rd, a Catholic member of Parliament receives a letter anonymous, warning him not to go to Parliament. Okay. Not to go to the opening sessions. So, he takes it to Robert Cecil and says, this is suspicious. Now, this was probably not the first Robert Cecil had heard of the plot. Mm -hmm. But something about the way the letter was written indicated that this was going to be a mighty blow against the king and parliament. Pun intended? Pun it probably intended. And so Robert Cecil kind of figures it out. But remember, Robert Cecil, he is, at this point, you know, the king's only been king for two years. Mm -hmm. He's trying to still ingratiate himself to the king. So he takes the letter to the king. Remember now that you know, this is a very bookish, very intelligent, well-read king. And he figures it out, too. And according to the official records of the gunpowder plot, it is King James who first makes the connection between this phrase, a mighty blow, and gunpowder. And says... This has to involve gunpowder. So whether Cecil is maneuvering him into figuring that out or whether he figured it out on his own, you know, or whether Cecil figured it out and told him and then they just said that the king figured it out, we don't know. But what happened was they ended up sending search parties into the undercroft under the palace. They're searching the whole palace, including the undercroft. And in the Undercroft, they find Guy Fox with the gunpowder. And he had a, a fuse that would have been long enough he could have lit it and gotten out and gotten down river before it blew. Um, so he had an escape plan. It wasn't a suicide mission. Sure. But they catch him. And he admits right out that this was a plan to kill the king in parliament. Matter of fact, he's interrogated by King James. This was not something strange for King James to do because he had involved himself in witch trials in Scotland. Okay. Where he had actually questioned witches. So he, he involved himself in these legal matters quite often. So he goes in and questions Guy Fox. Guy Fox admits to the plot, but will not give any names. But because he has admitted to the plot, this enabled him. It, you could not um, torture a confession out of someone, according okay. to English law. Yeah. A tortured confession was deemed inadmissible, but... Once somebody's guilt had been proven, you could torture them for information. Okay. So he had admitted the plot. So his guilt was attested to. So they tortured him to get the names of the rest of the conspirators. And he finally caved, gave them the names of the rest of the conspirators. Robert uh, Catsby and the rest of the group was out... In the Midlands, they had been on their way to kidnap the princess when a rider overtook them and told them that Guy Fox had been captured. Well, they went ahead and started telling Roman Catholic families that the king was dead, trying to raise an army 
Okay. But this failed miserably. Um, most of the Roman Catholics thought they were nuts to try to overthrow the king. And they well, were and all you saying, said earlier that they made up yeah, like 10% of the population. 10% of the people, and they were like... So if they're 10%, and then you get a lot of them exactly. think you're crazy. You're, yeah, you're, yeah you're I think gonna... they, were, they were looking at, you know... Uh, overwhelming forces that would be arrayed against them. Right. And their general reaction was, if you stir up the Protestants against us, they're going to wipe us out. Mm -hmm. You think things are bad now, wait until after this comes down. And indeed, they were right. Once the news of the plot got out, the, 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 the plight of the Roman Catholics in England was much worse than it had been. So, yeah, remember remember the 5th of November, Gunpowder, Treason, and Plot. The uh, Catsby and several of the other conspirators were killed instead of being captured. They had, well, for one thing, we still don't, nobody can figure this out. It was raining. I see the Darby, The weather was by bad. The huh? Sorry, I see Darby, by the way. Just oh, is she by. out running around? Just scurried yeah. by. Yeah. So, um the uh, it had been raining. They're riding through the countryside, trying to stay ahead of the English forces. And they got to one of their safe houses, and they found that they 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 were going to load up their muskets and and you know go out in a blaze of glory, kind of do the 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 um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid routine, just go out shooting <laughs> and get gunned down, and that would be it. But their barrel of gunpowder had gotten wet. Oh. Somebody had the help. brilliant idea to lay it out on the hearth. Oh. In front of the fire to dry it out. They had kind of a gunpowder reverse plot. <laughs> yeah, kind of. So there was an explosion, and uh, several of them you were think? injured. None of them were killed. Several of them were injured. And it was one of those things It's like... It's been speculated, were they trying to kill themselves? But it didn't work. Um, and so some were injured, whatever. So when the, the time for this glorious last stand happened, Catsby and a couple of the guys ran out with swords and were shot down with muskets. You know, they brought a knife to a gunfight kind of thing. Mm. So he was killed. Um, I think of the the 13 conspirators, six of them stood trial. And they were sentenced to what was at that time the standard death for a traitor. And that Drawing was to be quartered. hung, drawn, and quartered. Mm -hmm. So the idea was you would hang a person by the neck until they were almost dead. Then you would take them down disembowel them and draw out their intestines, then behead them, and then cut the body into quarters and send the quarters to the four corners of the kingdom as a warning to what happens to traitors. It's, it's kind of, you know, the ultimate death penalty as deterrent idea. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be tortured to death. So this was happened to all of them. Now, Guy Fox was very, uh, very strongly injured by the torture that they had. They had broken him on the rack, which pulls all your joints out of joint. Mm -hmm. And so he was having a hard time walking, etc. So they didn't tie his hands as they were leading him up to the gallows because he needed his hands to move safely and he was holding on to his jailer and everything as they were taking him up to the gallows. So he had his hands and feet free. Well, when they tied the rope around his neck, before they could hang him, he jumped and broke his neck. Oh. So he was actually dead when they disemboweled and cut him up. So, but, and he did that intentionally. Yeah. That was, but because he was so sorely wounded, they didn't think he would be able to do something like that. And yet he was able to engineer his own death before 
being tortured, but the rest of them were all tortured mm -hmm. to death. But this ended the, the, the plot. Now, coming back to that Father Gerard or John Jared, the Jesuit agent, mm -hmm. Robert Cecil wanted him bad. He'd wanted him before. This, this guy was like his nemesis. And the fact that, that he was there at that first meeting, to think that he wasn't involved, I think, is, is ludicrous. But So they're hunting for Cecil, and he's hiding. And they never find him. They actually search the house he's hiding in, but he's in one of these priest holes. Okay. A, a priest hole, the, the Catholic families would have a secret compartment, that usually a hole in the floor or a hole in the wall that would have a cabinet or something in front of it so you couldn't see the hole or have a table on top of a trap door in the floor sort of thing. Sure. And so he was hiding in this priest hole. And they searched the house and never found him. Hmm. And they actually questioned the Catholic widow who owned the house and, you know, threatened to kill her. Robert Cecil, she was a friend of Robert Cecil's. You know, he, he knew her. And even though she was a Roman Catholic, but he actually threatened to kill her. And she said, basically, do what you have to do. And so he ended up letting her go. Hmm. But they never found the priest. And eventually, pre, uh, peace was declared with Spain. And uh, so King James met with an ambassador from Spain, to, and a peace treaty had been established and everything. So the ambassador had visited the court, and they had exchanged whatever paperwork they needed to do. And with the priest le when the priest left, or the, the ambassador left, there was one extra person in his retinue, John, uh, this uh, John uh, Gerard, escaped England. What's disguised fake? as a servant of the Spanish ambassador. Yes, sir, and so Robert Cecil never got him. Mm. He got away. Mm. But yeah, that was that was an interesting an interesting plot. But what this ended up doing was it it pretty much ended Catholic plots sure. against the crown. Yeah. Um but yeah, I mean it's still remembered the fifth of November is a huge celebration in England yeah. and in fact the 5th of November and the English celebration of the 5th of November came to the United States and it ended up as trick or treat on Halloween oh okay <laughs> because you know it's just 6 days difference or 5 days yeah. difference and so it got conflated with All Hallows' Eve. Interesting. And the, the thing was, it, it, you go around, children go around with an effigy of Guy Fawkes. And they ask people to give them a penny for the guy. So they're collecting money. The Guy Fawkes effigy is burnt on a bonfire at night. But the kids who made it go around and collect money with him all day. Give okay. me a penny for the guy. Well, that became going around getting candy. Huh. It also became a night of mischief. So it was a night of prankery and mischief. And that's where, you know, we'll give you candy if you don't do a trick. Do a trick. Sure. Trick or treat. Your choice. We'll give you a treat, or you, yeah, and so that's it. it actually, Guy Fox, you know, what they call uh, bonfire night or Guy Fox night, the fifth of November, ended up coming to the American colonies and becoming trick or treat mm. on Halloween. Five days I was just earlier. sharing. Uh, Twenty sixteen, Fred Butler and I did an episode on Halloween. I remember which, that one, and yeah, we that talked about one. yeah. Um, you know, should Christians celebrate and stuff. And uh, yeah. so now with that, I'm going to have to put that 
episode as a related <laughs> in episode. Show, in the show notes so people yeah, can listen have to it. It to be a related yeah. episode because uh, we didn't, uh, I, I never knew that. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's that's actually how the trick or treat thing started in America. Yeah, and there's nothing occultic about that at all. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. But it, it started as a celebration of the fact that the King of England was delivered, and and of course, see the Protestants looked at this as divine affirmation of James's kingship, mm-hmm. and the fact that the gunpowder plot was discovered and thwarted was used to solidify James's divine right as king. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that yeah. under Elizabeth and that brewing yeah. up, that divine right so, of kings. But it, and, and it would even get worse under his son, Charles I, <laughs> which would lead to the, civil, the English Civil War. Mm-hmm. But that's another tale for another time. I had three topics yeah. to talk about tonight. Yeah, we were going to hit on the King James. Yeah, we're over yeah, I was going to talk about the King James Bible, and I was going to talk. I was figuring I'd spend most of my time on the witch trials. Yeah, that was a fascinating time. But we'll have to save that for some other time. Yeah, um, maybe yeah. maybe do the October issue next year. And we'll get into the witch trials and we'll just do fit. witch trials through the 17th century because see the, the 1600s, you, you have the first witch trials in the British Isles in Scotland in the 1590s mm-hmm. under James the sixth, James the, James sixth, the first. Yeah. And then he brings it down into England and you have several famous witch trials in England during James's reign. Then you have, Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder General, who spearheads several major witch trials during the English Civil War. Okay. And then the 17th century ends with the Salem witch trials in, in New England. Yeah. In 1693. So we can do a century of witch trials. That would be interesting. Yeah, because I like, I like I've it. Always, and, and the thing that has always fascinated me, and I'll just tease it this way. The Puritans had pretty solid biblical doctrine. I mean, I have, I have quite a few Puritans in my library, and it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. But how did the Puritans, with their good theology... And by and large, I'm not saying there weren't theological errors among in Puritanism. There certainly were. Yep. But how did the Puritans get caught up in these witch trial superstitions? And the answer is King James. Oh. And so it's an cool. it's an interesting story. I actually have his book. He wrote this while he was king of Scotland. Demonology. It's a witch trial manual. Okay. The King of Scotland wrote a book on finding and trying witches. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, that's what I thought we'd spend most of our time, but we didn't even get there. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, like I said, I always find these fascinating. And um... <laughs> Well, the gunpowder plot is an interesting yeah. Interesting thing. And there's Well, it's there's an interesting tie of, to what we talked about with Elizabeth and all the plots too. And right. It's, it's yeah, kinda, it's 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 kind of the same thing. It, yeah, it really was. It's an interesting it was way to kill wrap the up king the whole and whisk marry off the, the air. princess and rule the country through her yeah. and turn return it to Catholicism. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is when you look at the fact that England was by this point fairly confirmed in its Protestantism. Even had they blown up Parliament and killed the king, I think the plot would have ultimately failed. Yeah. I think there would have been such a huge backlash. Instead of witch trials, you would have had Catholic, it would have been hunting Catholics. I watched a documentary that was done by um, a a BBC, I think, documentary Mm -hmm. in. With, where they worked with the British military and they went to a explosives range in England 
built a full size House of Lords. Okay. From that time, with like six foot thick concrete walls, mm -hmm. timber roof, the whole bit. And they put 36 barrels of black powder under it. Kind of a Mythbusters? BBC version of Mythbusters? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> and they determined that, yes, it would have killed everybody in the building. You know, King James, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who ended up uh, heading up the King James Bible translation. Okay. You know, it would have changed a lot of things. Yeah. But they also said that it would have, it would have killed people, you know, not just in the room. It would have killed people on the street outside the palace. Wow. This would have been a 9-11 moment. Wow. Where the people of England would have gotten up in arms. It would have created a great deal of animosity against mm -hmm. the Roman Catholics and probably would have led to wholesale slaughter of Catholics in the streets. You know, there would have been no tolerance. Mm -hmm. They would have hunted down and killed the Catholics. You know, so I don't think that would have succeeded in establishing a Catholic monarchy. In fact, it probably yeah. would have pushed England even further into Protestantism. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. But by God's providence, they were caught. Yep. Yeah. You know, so but it was a a, a terrorist plot extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. And and but just think that you could rent the basement under part <laughs> That's of weird. You know. Um now of course, I mean, it, ha it happened to be because they had a minor noble who was able to do it. I mean, sure. Joe Schmo off the street couldn't have done it. But yeah, you could you could rent a an undercroft at the House of Lords. <laughs> and uh, and that's what they did. Yeah. But yeah, it never never blew up. They never were able to set it off. Cool. But they had the explosives in place. That's the thing. They had the explosives in place. Yeah. And I was looking, I I, I remember reading about this a while back and can't remember the name of the guy who actually caught the guy who I don't know if he's the guy that caught Guy Fox or the guy who discovered the the gunpowder yeah, there. The, the, there was the guy who who got the letter um and no, I I'm, I never got like I told you my my notes are in a, in a great disarray for tonight. I have all hmm. these different notes all over the place and I wasn't able to to bring them all together tonight into a concise note. So most of what I've done tonight has been out of memory. So, and my memory is horrible for names. Yeah. Well, you did great. And yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just skimming really quick. I'm on a Britannica article here. Yeah. Um, it was like Mosby or something was the guy that no, got the, the letter. Bell. I'm thinking of the guy who I, I, it might have been the same guy. Either either um, discovered the gunpowder itself or caught Guy Fox. You know, like I said, it could be. Well, that happened at the same time. Guy Fox was with okay, the gunpowder. Same. Okay. He was hiding in the cellar uh, who because the, the next morning was when Parliament was supposed to meet, and it was like ten, eleven o'clock at night that they discovered him in the cellar mm -hmm. with the gunpowder. You know, and actually, it was on the second search. They had actually found him down there the first time, and he just said, I'm a servant of Thomas Percy, and oh, okay. gave a false name, and they let him go. And then when they found him still down there a couple hours later on their second search. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Nivet. Was the person who was searching uh, the cellars? It was order a further search should be made by Thomas Nivet, a Westminster magistrate. Nivet, accompanied by his men on the night of November 4th and 5th, discovered the gunpowder and arrested Fox on the threshold. Yep. Fox, under torture, revealed the names of the Confederates and the extent of their participation in the plot on November 9th. Yep. Yeah, he Nivet, had that was, yep. Darby's that's running the name on I was wheel. looking for. Yep. I see Darby running on her wheel. Yeah. I can hear her, too. <laughs> I don't think the mic's picking it up, but I can hear yeah. her. I don't hear her. Yeah. 
But, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have the greatest. Garby. Uh, I got these uh, little ear monitors so that uh, when I'm doing these video episodes, I can hear without having those big cans on my head. Yeah, I'm just using earbuds. But, uh, yeah. But uh, thanks so much, Gene. And uh, I, I'm enjoying the whole series and look forward to the well, next so one. So far, every time I've had more to talk about than we've had time. Yep, exactly. Um, yep. It's, it's so a we'll pick up next time I, we can finish King James then the, the Bible and the witch trials. Yeah. The King James Bible, you know, there's really not that much to say. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting story, but it's not a huge deal. Okay. You know, he didn't translate it, you know, well, obviously, in fact, yeah. it wasn't his idea. Oh. It was the Puritans who wanted a new translation and, uh, they had demanded that, he do away with the hierarchy of the the Church of England, get rid of the bishops and everything, which okay. he was not willing to do because he liked that because the church was ultimately under his control. But he did the, the other one of the things that they had asked for was a new Bible because there were problems with the current translations. You know. And they were primarily using the Geneva Bible that before primarily that? using the Geneva Bible and um and the Geneva Bible was actually why James went along with the new Bible translation, because there were two notes. There's the Geneva Bible was a study Bible. It mm -hmm. had study notes. And two of the notes, it, it gave, uh, it applauded the midwives for disobeying Pharaoh. Okay. By not killing the Israelite children. Sure. And it applauded, uh, or it, it castigated Herod. Somebody, no, one of the kings for not. It, this is all Old Testament stuff. It okay. castigated one of the kings for not killing his idolatrous mother. Okay. And they were like, you know, no, we don't kill royalty. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that James does not like this, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you, we don't disobey royalty, and we don't kill royalty. <laughs> and when even when Elizabeth I, when uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed, it made her kind of queasy. She had kept Mary alive so long because she didn't want to establish the precedent of killing a monarch, mm -hmm. even one who had been disposed. To kill one of royal blood would have been a... Would be, you know, with a lot of the intrigue that's going on now, you'd wish that some of our own politicians would have the same kind of, uh, you know, scruples. You know, uh, yeah. such things such as raiding a former president's residence and whatnot. Is, I no mean, kidding. No you, kidding. Do you want to set precedence? Yeah. But uh, all of that kind of palace intrigue is kind of as old as the hills. It, it is. It, it is. Really like you say, we, we see all this stuff in the, the royal house of England and, you know, look back and go back and read the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And look at some of the stuff that was going on in the royal house of Israel, <laughs> yeah, or the royal house of Judah. Yeah, um, yeah. I just, I've, I've just gotten up to. I've been reading, reading through the Bible uh, on Squirrel Chatter, and just got up to the Babylonian captivity, and the plots and the assassinations and everything that was going on, especially in the northern kingdom of Israel. Yep. You know, I mean, they were like in the, after Solomon, after the kingdom divided, there were four or five ruling families in the north because they would revolt and the the old king would be killed and all his children would be killed and the new king would set up and, you know, he, he would reign and his son would reign and then his grandson would get killed and all of his descendants would get killed and another family would take over. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, all that's just, it's yeah. As long as there's have been or will be rulers there. Well, that was the intrigue. I, I, I read the game of Thrones books okay. long before the, then of course the, the book series has never been finished, but before the HBO series mm -hmm. and the books were not like the series. <laughs> In the, and I haven't followed either. Yeah, <laughs> so well, I take it word was for it. the 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 series that 
HBO ended up putting out was pornographic. And that's uh, why I haven't followed much it. Much gratuitous nudity. Any. And I, I, having loved the books, I started watching the series <laughs> and quickly stopped. <laughs> quickly stopped. Quickly yeah. stopped. Um, but the, uh, the books were still fairly brutal, just not as graphic. Mm-hmm. But one of the things at the very beginning of the book, well, uh, the very first books, it says when you start to play the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. You know, there's only two options. Mm-hmm. And that's fairly seriously true. Yeah. I mean, James the first son, Charles, is beheaded by Parliament. He's tried as a traitor and beheaded. You know, and here he was. He was like, "I'm the king. I can't betray myself. So therefore, I can't be a traitor." And he's like, "No, you betrayed the English people." You know, that's the other thing the 17th century does is it gives us the supremacy of Parliament in England. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the 17th century, the crown is sovereign. At the end of the 17th century. Parliament is, mm-hmm. because by the end of the 17th century, Parliament is naming the king. Mm. Yeah. Well, we don't get too far ahead of ourselves yeah. here. And, yeah. Lots but, of stuff uh, to talk about. It's all good and interesting. Yeah. And, all right. Well, thanks so much uh, for another one, and I yeah. do look forward to it. I, October sounds sounds like a good date. All right, to we shoot will plan with, on next October and I with, will try to uh, have more concise and... notes so that no. maybe we can actually finish the whole topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's mixed, you know, it, yeah. it, um, I do enjoy it, you know, um, it, we might talk about it more than you expected, but it, yeah. it's still enjoyable. So yeah. But, thanks so much. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I had planned 15 minutes on the, the gunpowder plot and then like 40 minutes on witch trials <laughs> and we didn't even get out of the gunpowder plot. So, <laughs> well, maybe we'll just expect to do the whole thing on witch trials. Yeah, that would be good. It's All interesting. Right. We could just, yeah, we, if we cover the, the witch try and di- trial in Denmark, the trials in Scotland is trials, like two of the major trials in England, and then mm-hmm. jump to the colonies and discuss the, the witch trials in new England because mm-hmm. Salem wasn't the only one. They had sure. witch trials in Connecticut as well. Okay. So, All right. Interesting times. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. All right. This episode of Echo Zoe Radio was recorded in front of a live studio hamster. Echo Zoe Radio is an outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries. If you are blessed by the show, please consider offering your support. There are many things you can do to help, including prayer, sharing the show with others, and your financial support. Echo Zoe Ministries is a registered nonprofit organization with 501c3 tax-exempt status, and your donations are tax-deductible. For more information about how you can support Echo Zoe Ministries, please visit echozoe.com support. That wraps up episode 175. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. For show notes, visit echozoe.com 175. Please also subscribe to Gene's daily podcast, Squirrel Chatter, which you can find in audio and video formats around the web, as well as at the Christian podcast community. Come join Echo Zoe Ministries on Locals. That's echozoe.locals.com. You can support the ministry there as well as interact with the community. And I look forward to seeing you there. Lord willing, we'll be back next month with the December episode of Echo Zoe Radio. (laughs) 